Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Investor's Mindset Podcast. And so um, we have four of us here today on today's show with me. We have Shane Haig, of course, uh, Reggie McFadden, and Brett Pope, a new addition down there to our uh, podcast. And the reason why we have Brett on there, we all recently attended the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting in Omaha, and it was a great event. As you know, they kind of come back, and uh, this is the first time doing it back in person from um, uh, the, the virus and everything. Uh, but to me, one thing that was really inspirational and I hear about it a lot, but I had to be there, I guess, to really experience it. But the energy of Warren and Charlie there at uh, mid 90s to late 90s in age um, is really a inspiration, you know, something to strive for for me and later in life. Uh, but the real uh, me to take away is, you know, they, they're a lot of the materials not new. They kind of um, maybe update it with new events of today, but the, the principles of the same. Um, what we talk about here about investing and not speculating or gambling. Uh, but I wanted to just go around here and see uh, from each one of the guys what what you took away from the meeting. And I'll start with Shane. Uh, for me, it was two things. Really, I mean, it's really six decades. These guys have had incredible investment performance and they have like worldwide notoriety. And so the two things that jumped out to me was that they're always pretty eager to discuss uh, something that didn't go well, you know, or lesson learned. It's almost like they're suddenly setting the uh, expectation that you can't bat a thousand in the business. Um, and so the other thing I think is it's remarkable given their status that they seem to just stick to their core competency. You know, it's like they have no problem saying, hey, well, that's just too hard. Put that in a too hard pile sitting over here. Or a lot of times they even say, oh, I don't know. You know, they're constantly asked questions like, how's the market going to do next quarter? Things that aren't really known or need to know to be successful. And they're very comfortable saying, I don't know. You know, and so it's really remarkable because it's constant that way. It's almost as if they let the masses focus on all the things that maybe aren't as important and they stick to just doing a few things right. And that's been real successful for six decades. All right. Well, thanks. And now kind of the, the inspiration for the trip. Uh, Brett got us all going and uh, getting new into value investing and learning everything. And of course, Warren and Charlie probably have a lot of information out there, a lot of teaching they've been doing. Um, but Brett kind of said, hey, well, why don't we go? I mean, um, it's getting late in their life. And if we're going to do it, uh, you know, um, we ought to go take that trip and, and do it now. And so really interested to see Brett, what you kind of taken away from the, um, show, you know, Warren and Charlie putting together there and a huge event in Omaha. So go ahead, Brett, what you, what you took away from the meeting. Yeah. So I really enjoyed the meeting, but the most important, like, thing that stuck out to me was Buffett had said the best thing to invest in is in yourself, especially during periods of high inflation, because if you are worth the quality and the price, people will still pay for it. And being young and in college and all that, that really resonated with me, you know, because I'm constantly learning and putting effort into being a investor. Like, Right. Oh so awesome. Yeah. So I, I remember that uh, coming away from that, too. There was a lot of career advice, especially from Warren. I think a lot of the questions were in that area and um, investing in yourself, you know, the ability to communicate, of course, the knowledge and reading. They do a lot of reading. Um, so Reggie, you know, as a CFA, what did you take away from the meeting? You know, like you, I was I was shocked. I mean, they were up there for I don't know seven, eight hours. You know, just 
the ability to sit there and, and be peppered with questions at, at their age and, um, you know, just the uh, humble, uh, funny nature of them both, too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I kind of heard, you know, it's a spectacle, but, you know, until you realize, until you see it with your own eyes, I mean, the amount of people there was crazy, you know, and so there's a lot of things to take away to just from markets and things like that, but just the, uh, you know, the excitement in the room when, when they get up there and start talking and seeing all the products and companies that Berkshire owns, I mean, it's, it's quite uh, phenomenal to, to actually see it in person. So I really uh, appreciated that aspect of it. Yeah, it was um, walking to that other arena, I guess it looked like to me, and they have all the all the companies, um, products for all of us to buy and look at that Berkshire Hathaway owns. Um, so it's very impressive. Um, and I think words don't quite do it justice. So I'm glad that uh, Brett got us going on that trip. It's really interesting. Um, and now kind of for the next subject, uh, back to the markets and how investor mindset kind of plays into what's going on right now. Uh, the most recent this and that talked about the, the tide going out. So to me, I don't want to have it mistaken like I'm trying to call a bottom here in the market, uh, but it's really that momentum of uh, going out kind of against uh, speculators and such. And I remember meeting a guy in, in Midland, Texas, and, you know, he's talking about the oil industry. We all know how very cyclical that can be. Uh, but he said, you know, you get to a point where bankers stop playing golf with the CEOs and the CFOs of these oil companies. You know, they're no longer buddies. And that's because the loans have gone sour. You know, they're not, these companies aren't able to pay them back. And we definitely see that now in the crypto space. Um, you know, even from the beginning of us doing this podcast, crypto was still had the momentum going with us, with it. But you could see the total shift now. And that to me is the tide going out. And so it kind of reminds us once again that in the long run, the investment performance that you will receive is more closely tied to the operations of that business. You know, in, in jargon, it's the discounted cash flows of that business um, over the next 10, 20, 30 years that you try to evaluate to analyze what that business is worth. Um, and we've all probably had a aha moment or something like that where um, you see that in practice, you know, and usually it, it takes some experience and years of watching things where you go, wow, man, that, that business came out of nowhere over a long period of time and they really compounded money. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go around the table here and say, uh as an example of that corporation that event where um sticks in your mind where hey this is really about investing and not about speculation of what the next person is willing to pay for something like in in the um coins the digital coins where you know it's really a where the next greater fool is instead we want to look at that those business operations and what kind of net income they can produce and cash flow, et cetera. So I'll just start with Shane here. Yeah, I thought about it last night and maybe I shouldn't have picked something that was down significantly, but I really mentally went right back to 2011 where we had a worldwide leading software company acquired just below $25 a share in May. And then a year and a half later, it was 26 and some change. So essentially it wasn't anything that was too sexy or popular, you know, going on. So the price is over here doing one thing, but if you look inside the business, you know, and I just took a metric, you know, a little homework, you see net income during that 12 month period was up 29%, even though it wasn't reflected in the stock price. 
And so to me, you know, there's it, a lot of times we say, and I've been guilty of it in the past, is, oh, it's not doing good. Well, the company might be doing quite well and everything we'd hope, it's just that it's not reflected in the stock price for a variety of reasons. And so um, that's not always your best indicator of how the company's doing. Just looking at the price alone doesn't tell you that much. It kind of reminded me too that maybe that year and a half was hard for some people um, and you had to have some characteristics to get through it. Something like patience, you know? <laughs> Um, really some patience to go a year and a half and go nowhere. And that's not easy. You almost had to have that long-term view where you kind of understood that, and maybe accepted that, you know. And then structurally within your portfolio, you probably needed time on your side so you didn't feel like you had to have a banger right out of the box, you know. And so when you put those all together, it's not easy, um, but it certainly can be done. That's my example. That's great. It reminds me of, um, you know, Reggie and I will probably – have another podcast about this, but a trigger event because I remember, you know, they changed CEOs and Nadella uh, came in and he read his book um, and he kind of said, "Hey, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna lay this out. Big thing, my big concept is it's about culture, and uh, a lot of people write in hindsight, and he said I'm I'm gonna write it up front, and so so far, you know, it's worked out great." Um, and so now, yeah, I know you have an interesting thing. You went through uh, Berkshire Hathaway's annual report and have a little example from uh, Warren there on uh, realizing that business operations that matter over the long term. So you want to go ahead with that? Yes. So it was in Berkshire's 1995 annual report. And it's about Geico. So I always thought that the way Buffett talks, he never sold Geico. He ended up just buying the whole company, but that wasn't the full story. And so in 1952, he actually sold all the shares that he had for $15,259 to get into a cheaper real estate uh, insurance company. Um, hmm. And in the next 20 years, that 15,000 would have turned into 1.3 million. Um, and it taught him a lesson. It said about selling a stake in an identifiably wonderful company. And thankfully for Buffett's sake, they went through some trouble where Buffett was able to buy Geico. Um, and he also went through a story that about share repurchases. So he originally only purchased 33% of Geico, and then it took 15 years of share buybacks, and they reached 50% before they bought the other 50%. And uh, I mean, you can see now looking at Berkshire, like lessons he's learned, like he's actually learned to look at the company and hold on to them. But you know, it's just kind of crazy. I didn't really expect that about Geico. That's interesting. You learn in one of other uh, Charlie Munger's other points in life is um, you can learn through reading and other people's experience and you don't have to experience it that yourself. But um, I want to go back. So so they bought 33 percent of the company. Never bought another share, but after 15 years, ended up with 50 percent because the operations of the company was buying back shares. Right. Yes. Yes. That, that is a um, great demonstration of the how the operations of the business can uh, make an investor shareholder money. And you don't have to speculate on the short term whether interest rates are going up, inflation, et cetera. So on now to Reggie, what you got in this category? I'll kind of turn it around uh, from the other side. You know, Shane had mentioned Microsoft and and even uh, with the share repurchases. But uh, up until recently, they had these, uh, you know, high flying tech stocks that there's no way, regardless of growth, that they would be able to the company itself would be able to grow into that. I mean, it was you were paying crazy multiples, uh, the price to sales were through the roof 40 times and people were just buying it because they were going up. 
And then on the share repurchases is, you know, Buffett uh, talked about it, but uh, share repurchases at the same time can be negative if it's uh, for short-term reasons based on CEO's compensation, trying to get the stock price up, and they're just going to pay whatever price they have to pay. And at the end of the day, that ends up hurting the business itself over the long run. And so it's kind of the reverse of both both examples. Right. That's a very good uh, point because it, it works both ways. You have a horrible company, horrible management, et cetera. Um, the worst thing you could do is hold those things for a long time because it's just going to erode your value. Um, and then we recently had a another this and that where uh, we talked about the investors approach to inflation and one of the main themes or points I wanted to get across was we want to avoid making capital allocation decisions based on our speculation our prediction of what the inflation is going to be what interest rates are going to be and where the economy is going and that is very hard to do when if you just turn on CNBC or anything like that, a bunch of uh, business news networks and they have to fill up time and keep your attention, it's a lot better to have this on or off, yes or no, are they gonna win or lose? Is the economy going up or down? When you get into the details of any business and it's a lot more complicated than that, there's not a yes or no type of answer to anything. Um, so my qu question to Shane is when you, when you have an individual meetings with clients and you're trying to, trying to kind of fight that, uh, global, uh, environment where all the media talks about investing as in speculation, uh, what, what are some of the ways you kind of, you know, reset that in clients' minds and meetings, et cetera? Um, I think two things there's in really there's a structure and then there's the expectations, you know, um, the structure is first is where you have your allocation with them for reasons, you know, and you keep several years worth of plan or things that you need and withdrawals outside of the investments so that you have time on your side and you need that within the structure. Um, but within the expectations, Quite simply, and everyone's seen it in all the reviews, I go, we have the seven key reminders for an investment mindset, you know, and we kind of humbly remind everybody, hey, we, you know, we have discretion, there's no guarantees, we can't predict, you know, economic events, you know, some things will fail to achieve their objective this year. And when you break all that down, you can also start to see that develop in your portfolio over the years, and you maybe have a more understanding right. acceptance, and it allows you to accept the things, the unknowns and the futures that we can't predict or know about but we've got the structure in place to combat that a little defense and then really just mentally thinking of it as an investor allows you to get through some of those periods even like today. Yes, uh, great points there. And that uh, addition of this and that, we also discussed um, investors should focus on you know, looking for quality businesses to kind of make it through these manias and panics that occur based on you know the market participants going into speculation even getting to the gambling side where they don't really care they just want to participate for the excitement um but reggie you have any examples that stick in your mind uh previous manias or panics where stock price was totally based on price speculation and not the value of the underlying asset underneath it. Yeah, I think it, you know, first thing, and even uh, I guess we're on the Buffett uh, after talking about going to the annual meeting, you know, but they even mentioned um, kind of the, the mean stocks and it's just solely based on, on price and nothing to do with the actual company. and. Um, you know, the AMC was, was issuing debt, issuing shares. At the same time, uh, movie theaters were not even hardly reopening, and you get this large price increase, and everybody's 
feels like they're missing something. And uh, it's just, it's insane how price drives curiosity, which feels like you're missing out on something. And it's uh, just trying to get back to focusing on, on fundamentals. And, you know, Buffett even said, we're not stock pickers, we're business pickers. And, and finding good businesses at decent prices is really the key to success. Yeah, and I think that um, I brought that up. That that's really one of those periods I think that'll stick in our memory uh, for a long time. Is when what was it Reddit uh, chat yeah. board or something was driving these stock prices, and um, it, it's a great example. Um, and I think the, the financial industry doesn't do uh, the people it hopes to serve any justice either. I mean, you know, then you, you see on CNBC or you see on some news outlets that uh, these JP Morgan even are, are trying to speculate on what's going to be the next Reddit stock or, <laughs> you know, like trying to get ahead of the, the mania, which is, is probably 10 times worse, but they're, they're selling it to individuals. And, and of course, hey, Oh, I got to feel like I'm missing out on something. And, uh, you know, they have mean ETFs now, like allowing the public to actually Man. buy into things. Like what the most Reddit mentions are, and we're going to put that in an ETF, package it up, yeah. and sell it to the retail investor. Uh, yeah, it's that, that old, uh, beauty contest description trying to outguess the guessers. Uh, that, that gets very hard and probably a short-lived career, so I want to stay away from that. Um, but I've been I've enjoyed this meeting with y'all. Uh, very good. I enjoy going to the Berkshire Hathaway uh, meeting as well. Something I'm gonna you know remember for the rest of my life. Um, so, but before we end here, I just want to give each one of you an opportunity. Maybe something else popped up uh to share any additional thoughts so i'll start with shane any any parting thoughts um as we close uh, this out maybe a little bit um since we can talk to everybody at once in this venue you know we're sitting here it's july 12th uh and, and i just looked this up you know because you hear the words correction bear market recession that's just a lot that's dominating the news right now and so I always think of it in terms, what do they mean? And a lot of times people aren't sure, but somehow over time, the commonly accepted definition of the correction is 10% lower from the, you know, the indice from the peak. And then when you hit that 20% metric, it becomes a bear market. But when I looked it up, you know, and I think you put it in the last this and that, and Peter Lynch said, hey, when it happens, it's like being surprised if you live in Minnesota, it's freezing, you know, you know these things happen. <laughs> you put on your parker to go about your business. And maybe we should do one, uh, Southern, if it gets, to, you know, it's no surprise, it's over 100 degrees, you know, go find the shade tree or get in the AC. But there's really been 28 uh, bear markets since 1928, and that's about 95 years worth. So it's not pleasant, but it's certainly expected. You know, you just never know when they're coming. And so um, I don't know if everyone sees it that way or necessarily, or, you know, looks at it maybe as a historical opinion. I think if, if you were a grandpa teaching your kids, hey, invest, you know, uh, save for yourself, do these things, you know, and by the way, every once in a while, you're going to have periods where the fluctuation goes against you, you know, and that's as normal as can be. Maybe you should expect it, plan for it. Maybe you could actually invest more during these periods. Um, but that's what's going through my mind. All right. Great thoughts. Uh, on to you, Reggie. Any, any final thoughts to add here? Yeah, you know, we get a lot. Uh, is, it, is it time to buy? Should I buy? Do I need to sell? And, um, you know, that turns into uh, market timing, which, uh, you know, uh, there's <laughs> one thing I know we're not good at is, is timing the markets and, and um, Buffett even, uh, you know, blatantly has said, hey, I missed March 2020 when you, we had the big correction. And even uh, back in 2008, I think it was around September, um, he was saying buy American. And of course, that was right around the Lehman crisis. And yet another six months before you ever found a bottom. 
And, uh, you know, I guess even back to this year, he was putting $50 billion in uh, in March. And obviously, we've had a drawdown since then. So, you know, market timing is tough, and uh, we don't pretend to do it. And uh, it's something that I know we can't be successful in. And, um, you know, it, it gets hard because of the financial media. And so anybody tells you they can, just just kind of back up and say, uh, how do they know something that everybody else doesn't? <laughs> yes, uh, made, made me think of thoughts back at that meeting that I was having. Um, because he's, he's famous, he's, he's wrote a piece, I guess, in late 1999. Uh, in Forbes and in 2008, you know, Buy American, because that's what he's doing, talking about Buy American businesses. Um, and they were contrarian pieces, you know, the, the market's going in the opposite direction. And so when we look back, it looks like, man, he, he's timed this market perfectly. Um, but also remember in 1999, he was out of favor for three years, you know, um, because he, he was cautious probably from 1997. You, you get this pullback in March 2020, and now it comes out, you know, Munger's a little bit on him saying, hey, man, I mean, we, we, we got more money than anybody, and we didn't even buy anything in his pullback in March 2020. And so he rightfully pointed out, you know, I'm, I'm might get this reputation, but we're, we're horrible at market timing. Um, but Charlie also used word a word in describing how they built Berkshire Hathaway over these years um, that really stuck with me because I I put a lot of focus on that being contrarian where he's writing things in 1999. And then 2008, you know, by American. And um, he said, we built a peculiar way of building this business. And so that really stuck with me because that's not contrarian. That's really them analyzing businesses. As they say, they don't have some long-term plan of how to build Berkshire Hathaway, but kind of take it one day at a time. And so that really stuck with me. Um, I don't know Brett and I have talked about that for you know a few few things of what stuck with us at the meeting, and we really enjoyed having you on here, Brett, on this uh, podcast as well as in Omaha visiting with uh, Uncle Charlie and you know Warren. But do you have any any parting thoughts for us here today before we close this out? Um, so I really appreciate y'all having me. Um, I have one more thought. It comes from the 1995 Berkshire Hathaway letter. And it was, he was talking about acquisitions, but I think it could also go into market speculation and to all that. And he said, um, I'm trying to remember it fully, but uh, so a horse, like a rancher, had a, had a horse, my bad. And sometimes he would limp and sometimes he'd walk fine. So he takes him to the vet and he tells the vet, sometimes my horse limps, sometimes he walks fine. And the vet goes, well, I have the perfect solution. Whenever he's walking fine, sell him. And that's <laughs> essentially how the market uh, acts. You always see at whenever everything's hitting all times highs, every company is great, but, and then when everything's at a low, everything's going to go bankrupt, even Berkshire or something. Everything has a problem. And it's always, yeah. there's always a, another face of the coin, essentially. Yes. Great, great story. Way to wrap this up, Brett. And uh, we all want to give a big thank you to all of y'all viewers and clients. Um, for me, until next time, you know, be safe out there and keep your investor mindset. Take care.